Hi, Mary. Thanks for joining me today, friend. It's great to be here. So I want to give a little bit more introduction than I usually do to this episode to set some context. Um, let's see. So about a month ago, Eric, who's been on this podcast twice, two of my favorite episodes for sure, uh, <laughs> suggested that I have you on. And I was like, well, that sounds great. And I don't know Mary at all. So I would love to get to know Mary before I have her on. And um, this is pretty common. I don't know. I like to have a sense of who people are before I have them on, mm -hmm. if at all possible. And uh, so you very kindly agreed to do a call where we just got to know each other a little bit. And I, yeah, that's what I was expecting it to be, a call where it's like, oh, I'll get to know someone new. She's probably really nice and really interesting. I love meeting people. It'll be good. And then that call was just like very different than I expected. And um, really, I did, in fact, of course, enjoy getting to know you. But it was like, uh, wow, Mary is incredible. Eric was totally right. I should have her on the podcast. And I would love to collaborate with this person for a very long time on a specific project that I was telling you about. And um, some things really also clicked into place for me about mm -hmm. some of the projects that I've been up to and how they fit together and where they might be going in a way that was really interesting and useful for me. And I was like, oh, I'd love to collaborate with you on these things. So um, yeah, that was just such an enjoyable conversation has made me really look forward to this recording. And I think there's a lot to dive into there. Um, is there anything you'd wanna say about the context of the conversation we had last week or this one before we dive in? No, I think you, you covered that quite well, at least like the arc of how we got to where we are right now. Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful. Um, well, in that case, I'll ask you the big hard question that I ask everyone at the beginning, <laughs> which you can answer in any detail you like, short or long, uh, which is kind of what is your life story and what's your background and you know who are you? What would you like to share with the world about, about yourself? It's a big question, mm -hmm. a big, big question. Mm. Yeah, and I, I like the question, the last part of how you phrased it, what would you like to tell the world uh, about yourself? And like, what would I like to share in this conversation? Um, mm. I think the, the start of it um, and the start of, of who I am, a lot of how I orient to life and, and also different projects um, has been uh, colored by the fact that I was born in Poland and I lived there until I was 10. And then my parents packed up three little girls and five suitcases and moved them across the ocean about 17 years uh, ago. And that has really, that has made a huge, it, it's changed my life. Like my, my life would not have been the same had I had my parents not moved and they moved for, for us, for me and my, and my two younger sisters, uh, particularly to just, just for us to have much many more possibilities in our lives. And, and <clears throat> that has, and, and my life has been so so fortunate and the possibilities have expanded from there uh, because of that. Um, it has also taught me so much about what it means to like start your life from scratch. Like my parents moved when they were I think around 30 or 35 and they left everything that they ever had there. So I have the sense that that you can start anywhere um, and kind of build build up from there and and the sense of community and care and relationship to resources to uh, to to family to meaning um, all of that being wrapped up uh, in there and I always I often think back to those to those uh, to those moments and um, feels like that's one kind of one one milestone another feels kind of who who I am and what feels relevant is because of the possibilities because of what my family moving over um i was able to develop so many so much interest in so many different areas uh in my life and and i did pretty well at school but i loved so many different things when it came to picking a a, a program in university um i couldn't choose i loved i loved math and english and and um also different sciences and was curious about so many things um and i thought i was going to go into math or like since grade nine uh, which is in in ontario and canada 
Canada from grade nine until grade 12 is, is high school from grade nine. I thought I was going to do math. Like I thought that I was going to do until grade 12 when I went to an enrichment program at the University of Waterloo uh, called Unlimited from which this super niche program called Knowledge Integration uh, was born probably a decade ago. So maybe a little less than less than that. And I fell in love with it. Like I fell in love with with um, the program, which at its core is, is the idea to become a bridge between different disciplines and this this um, translator between different people who are wanting to solve the world's complex problems, but are speaking different languages. And um, and how to think in in a collaborative sense how to how to create projects that that merge and and connect different uh different different people different backgrounds different languages we took a variety of different courses uh again in like math sciences uh research ethics research methods um computer science um critical thinking speech communication so all of the wide variety and it was so cool to then go into all these different faculties and all these different spaces and recognize recognize that they are actually saying the same thing, but they're just not using the same language. So then become then the bridge and see where, where there are um, opportunities to connect people and to connect the ideas to create something uh, uh, magical in, in many ways. Um, from, from there, I realized how much I loved working with people, like how much I loved um, seeing like what's possible when people work together, what's possible when um, when like you really pay attention to to someone and you actually hear what they're saying behind behind the the words that they might be might be communicating. Um, and I was also fortunate around the the time um, in an university, I became part of a community where we're orienting to each other in a um like a collaborative way and seeing other people as as um like other humans and how it is to be human together and how to approach uh so much of of life in each other with curiosity with care with revealing our own experiences and i did a lot of personal work of of untangling different different uh tangles around perfectionism um have different course of patterning and of course like everything that school has has taught about what it taught us about what it means to be right and wrong um what what how learning can feel in a very a very it can be really challenging for for some people even the process uh, the process of learning um and then from there um knowledge integration is a fantastic program it, i also didn't I don't know, didn't think far enough where I, I took such a wide approach to it. I didn't come out of it with like a, a job that I was going to do. I didn't come up with like a programming thing or like I was going to go into a particular field, but I knew I loved working with people. So um, I worked at an inventory management company and then I worked at a financial consulting agency as a user experience designer. And at the financial consulting agency, I, th I thought I got everything that I wanted. I was like, on Bay Street, Banking, on Toronto, which is like the Wall Street of of uh, Toronto, these big buildings and uh, work trips and everything else, and I was I was miserable. I was so so miserable, and I felt trapped in what was going on, and and also thought this is what I wanted to be to be doing, and I recognized that the step to the next thing wouldn't be to get a new job. I realized I just needed a lot of space in in my life. And so um, me and one of my best friends went on a hiking road trip. We climbed this gigantic rock called Angels uh, Landing in a Zion National Park. It's the most dangerous hike. You climb up this gigantic chains. Uh, we went super early. Um, and I climbed up and down it. And then I told myself, if I can do that, I can do anything. So I quit my job. <laughs> when recommended to everyone uh but it was definitely a step that I needed to do and then I got into my car and drove three days to the east coast of Canada where I I stayed there for two months um luckily with a, a, a close friend of mine that was kind enough to let me stay in their their place and I cried every single day trying to figure out what is it that I want to be doing with my life and and untangling these 
fears that I have around being successful or like I've already quit my job three, three times. I don't know what to do. I'm supposed to know what I'm going to do. Um, and just gave myself a lot of space, which was so valuable at the time. I ended up taking a, I'm, I'm a learner. I love learning. I love absorbing things. I love kind of all of that experience. And I've been doing so much work on myself. I ended up taking a, like a life coaching course. I thought it would be more for me than anything else. I, again, I fell in love with it. I have a tendency to just like fall in love with things. I'm very emotional and like very mm. like, like loving whatever happens. Um, and I fell in love with it. I love the combination of like problem solving, but also working with people and like this experience of, of, uh, of growth and like supporting someone, guiding them. And so um, I did some prototypes. So I like ran a workshop and then did some free coaching. And then I opened my coaching business, Life Worth Loving Coaching um, in January of 2020 and have been like so enjoying that process for the past two years. It's been the most challenging and the most uh rewarding thing i've ever done in my life and at the beginning of it, i told myself if in a year i don't um i'm not learning anything more then i'm not i'm i'm just gonna try something else kind of give myself a, a period to try it out um but i loved it it's been two years it's gonna it's I'm running on my third one and i honestly don't don't want to be doing anything else um and not even not even coaching. Like I love the work that I do with people, but what coaching is more more than anything to me is is the opportunity to lift people up, to like see their gifts, guide them into what they are, um, like recognize with them and work with them of what blocks are in their way, and to to support them in in ways that they maybe have never been been supported in their entire life especially kind of around work um it's i think work is something that that we often feel like we, there's a lot of constrictions like extension of school and and there's so many more possibilities of seeing work um also work is an interesting phrase for me because it expands so much more than how we earn money it's like how do we express ourselves in the world and how do we create impact and navigate relationships and just like flourish and grow um and so it's, it's coaching is one way of doing that. I feel like there's kind of a flood of a variety of different different things that that emerge from it. Um, but the most important thing for me is like how to help people move from the like right and wrong. The world is out to get me or I need to be a per specific shape. Or I need to be doing specific something to a like I can't fall out of the universe uh experience when we're seeing ourselves as learners and collaborators collaborators there isn't like a a right and wrong but a just like a cycle of experience uh that happens that happens in our lives um so that's kind of the the story of of my life um and i guess i guess one last thing is i'm right now on the on the west coast of of canada in british columbia which has been a dream of mine for the past five years um, I grew up, going back to the beginning, I grew up in Poland. I grew up in the south uh, of Poland, um, which is where the mountains, you can see them on the horizon. And I still remember how it feels to like see the jagged edges. And there's something so beautiful about that. Uh, Ontario is very flat. Like where Toronto is very, very flat. So when I went to visit uh, British Columbia about six years ago um, for about a month, it's like I this felt like home. This was where my heart is and this is what it felt right to be. And this past year, I promised myself that I was going to try out living here on, on the West Coast. Um, and I did. I got out of the shower in uh, May of 2021 and bought a one-way ticket to Vancouver uh, and then decided to be here for three months and tried it out, met some absolutely amazing people, Eric being one of them, Malcolm and, and, and Sarah, but also the community here in Victoria. Um, and I decided to make the move. It's a big leap, but it also speaks to... To, um, the sense of courage that that I have and and what it means to be kind of moving forward and trying things out so that's that's a long story you give an opportunity 30 seconds or 30 minutes I don't think oh. I'm 30 minutes but <laughs> no so much in there thank you so much for sharing it's just a, a beautiful story and also uh feels like very much like the beginning of a journey still mm -hmm. excited to see where you go from here and, and hopefully we'll talk about that. Um, so many questions coming out of this. So, so just first off, um, you said something at the end that I want to make sure I understood correctly. You said 
Um, I, I might have misheard it, but can you clarify what you said and what you mean by it? You said something like can't fall out of the universe. What, what, mm -hmm. what, what did you say there and what does that mean? Yeah. Um, for me, the, the, the difference of mindsets of or kind of orientations to the universe and our lives um, can broadly be categorized in my perspective of like, the world is a place where I can win or lose, or the universe is is a place where I need to always always try to get um, like I always need to to try to get better, or else I'm going I'm going to lose. I I was talking with with someone just yesterday, um, actually, in their experience of of that something is wrong, and they're just spending their entire life trying to catch up to the guilt that they, they of something that they think that they some sense of them has that they've already been doing something something wrong and that they just need to constantly be catching up or trying to make re repairs of something. Um, and I, I know that not, not everyone feels that way, but it can be an experience of like, I, there's always something that I can do more of. And there's another perspective of seeing, seeing our lives are like, I can't do anything wrong, wrong in the sense that I can't, I can't make a mistake that will mean that the world is going to end in some way, that I'm going to fall out of this universe, fall out of this care of, of um, being loved and, and, and being alive. And I think there's so much freedom that can come from, from recognizing that we have, we have choices, that, that it, all, it all feels connected, but you can't fall out of the universe, you'll have choices and, and the choices, um, they can lead to mistakes, but only mistakes are things that you can you can learn from, and those again are not are not something that's going to decide where you are on the ladder of 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 success or hierarchy or status. Mm. That's so beautiful. Thank you for clarifying that. It's it's just such a, a lovely image, and uh, yeah, I think such an important mindset shift that that a lot of us go through at a certain point. So I love how you captured that. Um, yeah, so circling back, there's there's a few points in your story that I'm kind of curious to hear more about. And maybe just to begin, like, I can't even imagine moving at 10 from one country to another and like, you know, presumably learning a new language and yeah. like whole new culture. And I, I mean, that just has to be like fundamentally formative in your life. And I'm wondering what you remember of that time and how you think about it now and like how that shaped you as you understand it now. Yeah. Oh, there's so many, there's so many layers, uh, mm -hmm. layers of it. Mm. One is like, I, I remember almost the entirety of it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I remember even the experience of my parents telling us that we're going to, mm -hmm. to move to a different country and me telling the kids in my school and the, and the teachers, and we actually moved halfway through the school year. So around mm -hmm. Christmas time, um, so this, this feeling of, of not knowing where I'm going. Also, Canada is like very far from Poland. Like in, in Europe, Canada is like the land of the polar bears, and of, the, of the igloos, like uh -huh. don't know what's going to happen. My grandmother and like knit our teddy bears, oh. like winter outfits, oh. Oh. Um, because they also didn't know how it was going, what it was going to happen then. My parents were taking, taking a big, a, a huge leap that we didn't have any family here. They just they themselves have so much spirit um, mm. and, and each other in that. Um, and I remember them uh, like also going through the process of, of immigration and, and my dad learning English, doing tests and, and us sitting in our living room with like an English teacher trying to teach us English and trying to, to show the difference between like the, like the and though like the, 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 and like, how do you even move your mouth to, mm. exp to like make those sounds? And my youngest sister, like falling asleep and my parents being very concerned, like, what is this child going to be? Like, how is she going to survive in this, in this possible new world? Um, and I remember, uh, I remember the flight over, but before that, I remember driving away from my, my grandparents' house. And I remember seeing my, my dad's, uh, father, out the back window, like crying, waving us off because there was a possibility that we'd never see them again. Um, that has definitely changed. My my mom's parents came like for for months, and mm. there was a lot more of that. But there was so much not knowing of what is going to 
to be mm-hmm. there on the on the other side. Mm-hmm. Um, I remember parts of the the airplane ride, but the thing that sticks out to me the most, and still to this day I feel it, is I remember we were we were taking a, a flight during the night. We were landing in Toronto during the night, and I remember looking out of the plane window, and Toronto is absolutely beautiful from the sky at night. It was the most beautiful thing my ten year old self have seen mm. up until that time, and s- like this like magical place. Um, that I didn't even think about that it was possible, like whatever the possibilities of what was going to happen, but just like, it was so beautiful. Uh, and then at the airport, we were so tired and like arriving in Canada and you know, those like sidewalks that like move forward. Mm. It was like, oh my God, Canada's the best country in the entire world. Cause we don't have to like walk so far in the, at the airport. Cause Pearson airport is huge. Mm. But like to these, I'm, I was, nine, 10. And then my other sister was eight and the last one was six. So like mm-hmm. little, little kids. And my parents just like, like we're, we're going to get there. We're going to get there. Um, and I remember arriving in the apartment, the first apartment that we had and, and my parents had some friends. And so they, they like, we had a full fridge when we arrived, which is a big mm, deal. You don't have to so like sweet. find any, anything else, but arrive. And there was like a picnic table, like folded up picnic table, two mattresses and like four or five, four or five chairs. So mm it's like you can start from nothing um nothing really the the next couple of months and we we ended up going to school interestingly um my uh legal name is not mary it's maria Mm. uh but it's something that nobody has ever really called me because in polish there's like a like a short form name and how mary came about is that we went to the to the school office and um the secretary like renamed us essentially mm. like maria i don't know if she thought it was like not it's it is a normal english name she's like mm. mary's good for you and and <laughs> my sister anna was anna and and ola whose full name was alexander was alex but like anya and ola's names stayed huh. they like stayed as they were and i just ended up being mary huh. Huh. and so it's always funny to me we're like mary's not my real name <laughs> it's like given this in this like new new mm. land mm-hmm. <laughs> um <laughs> was so interesting yeah um and then from there uh, we were all very fortunate to be at a school where the esl program the english as a second language program was like very very strong and so we were taking out of the classroom for a good chunk of the the day when we did like english and math and and other things and like worked one-on-one with with different teachers to kind of bring this up to up to speed um there is a huge polish community in mississauga where we landed so like most all three of us had like a Polish friend that could like try to translate, mm. um, try to translate for us. But the the big thing that I know is that I don't remember much of that time. Like I think parts of me just blocked off because I was taking in so much information. But it was, uh, I think, it was very, 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 uh, definitely very impactful. And one cool thing for me in particular was that in we arrived, I arrived in grade four, and then uh, elementary school ends in grade eight. And I had the same teacher in grade four as I had in grade eight. Mm. So she saw like the change that I've come over the the, the four years. Mm. Um, and I always joke in grade eight, I got like the English award and I say I got it for like most improved <laughs> uh, <laughs> <laughs> over funny. the four years. Uh-huh. Um, but it has, it's been really meaningful to have that, uh, like that experience throughout it. And by, by grade six, Six, six or seven definitely by seven I was like in the classroom full full time because over time kind of the English my English improved right. um but it's also meant growing up in in a home where my mom really made sure that we didn't lose the Polish mm-hmm. language mm-hmm. um so we didn't have a swear jar at home we had an English jar and we mm. had to like throw money in it whenever we spoke English at mm. home mm. uh we could sing to each other but uh so we got very creative at like singing things that we were saying you could you could sing in English or in Polish? Yeah, briefly. in English. We could sing in, in English. I see. Yeah, okay. Because we convinced my mom that it's really hard to translate lyrics of, of English. So we like uh-huh. tried some workarounds. Very uh, clever. With that, yeah, we were we were fun. Uh-huh. Um, but it has also for my life right now, it means that sometimes it's hard to like my Polish level is stuck on like around grade twelve. Not grade mm-hmm. twelve, uh, age twelve mm-hmm. or so. Mm-hmm. Um which means, and, and my, my mom and my dad and all of my family speak Polish fluently and their English is like 
probably around that a little maybe a little bit higher higher level in some things but it mm -hmm. means that oftentimes communication um can be hard i think i have a hard time expressing my emotions because so much of my emotional growth and being an adult is in english mm -hmm. and a lot of the work that i do as well has like very specific words in it or even words that are might be novel or might be niche in how they're in how they're expressed so uh it takes like extra effort for me to think uh, about it and there is I think sometimes shame that can get looped into like not knowing the word mm. um, mm -hmm. or like not being able to find it in your head I don't know if you speak any other languages uh, not not it's a different levels uh, it's like intermediate level at best certainly yeah. not fluent so it's interesting when you're like saying a sentence in Polish and like I don't remember the the word for a single thing in there and mm. like do I get stuck do I like use Ponglish, which is like Polish and English uh -huh. mix in there, like pasta, pasta stotka, which is like pasta hairbrush, but like, <laughs> like, uh, um, so it's, it's, it's interesting being in that relationship. And my mom often asks and is very curious about the work that I do. And I've actually started like making a, a list of words that I can think of just like, even if we're not speaking that I just translate in Polish, mm. um, to have a list of like refer to them, mm. um, over time so it has been very um yeah there's been a lot of impact um to that um in my life and how to think about communication how to think about um it has also meant uh for a lot of my life like my parents didn't help me with homework mm -hmm. um a lot of that was something that i needed to do myself i or my sisters were usually ones like when you went to the, when we went to the doctor and we went anywhere it's like we were the translators the translators that were that were doing things for my um for my mom in particular or or my parents so it it's it's fascinating to see like to to take in the relationships and how they're influenced um by things um things like that so that's part of it. There's there's even further layers, but that's kind of the mm -hmm. the big things. Hmm. And what was it like emotionally for you at the time? Yeah. Um I remember it was something interesting that I think I I, I remember my mom saying or, or at a at, they they knew that we were going to come to Canada probably around two years or so before that. And so there was a way that I think my mom, um, I think my mom in particular, like oriented our social group even to to like center more in the family. We were also really young, so it's not it's not that that um, it's not like she was like preventing me from making connections with other people. Like I still have friends at school and things like that. But a lot was focused on like, the the time that we spent together and when we moved i didn't feel like i was leaving anybody behind mm. um there was a lot of safety in in my like my family and and in how my parents were like able to hold um the context um i also feel really grateful in that like my parents are a beautiful team like mm. they are 100 percent on each other's teams and i wish to have a relationship uh like them mm. um and i also have never for better or for worse have never experienced them yell at each other mm. so it's like there i there's never happens has never ever happened uh, so it's actually i'm scared when people yell mm -hmm. because i have never experienced that so it feels it feels like the world is actually ending if it comes to if it comes to that mm. um but it has meant that there was a lot of stability in in that mm. um my parents also um like poland is a very at that time it's much much more developed right now but it was very um it was expensive to live there my dad was a was a prosecutor so he had a good job but still my parents decided they were going to kind of branch out on their own and not have a lot of support from their parents early on mm -hmm. but it had meant like my parents saved up for a year for to get us shoes mm -hmm. like mm -hmm. we couldn't go skating because it was just really, really expensive. Um, and because of the process they were moving to Canada, there wasn't so, there wasn't like so much, so much excitement. But we moved to Canada, my parents were like, we made it, we're going to like, um, like, like reward us and themselves. 
Um, so that first summer, like they bought us passes to Wonderland, which is mm. like the theme park there. And we went like dozens of times and we had like family trips that were so, so important. And I remember like driving to New York and back and did so many, so many things. Um, I think it was also hard for me, but I don't remember it being very, very hard. Um, I know, I know it must be hard. It must have been hard for, for my 10 year old self because Miss Patton, the grade four and grade eight teacher, when uh, she, we were talking, I think when maybe I came back a couple of years after elementary school was like, do you remember the time where I just like started speaking English to you and you just like burst out into tears? Mm. And I was like, absolutely not. Mm. But I, I definitely matched this with my feeling of overwhelm. Mm. um overwhelm at the time mm. um another big thing is that um like i'm a perfectionist and like i want to do really well and it's important for me to do really well and the education system in poland um is very coercive like mm. very very uh or has been i don't know how it is right now um like punishment based and shame based and so from grade one until three in, in Poland, I would wake up every single day with a stomach ache being like, mm. I don't want to go to school. Mm. Um, I don't want to be like called out. Um, yeah, Cause how it works is like you're in a classroom and then for a test or any kind of day, you're, the teacher says stand up and then asks you a question. You either get it right or wrong. And depending if you get it right or wrong, they say A or F and then like in front of the entire class, sit mm. down next. Um, mm. Or like, your dumbass sit down like next uh -huh. um and it i remember coming to canada and it was so chill it was <laughs> people wrote with pencils uh -huh. in poland like you write with fountain pens Polish people have the same cursive writing everyone has the same cursive writing because mm. you learn it like with a fountain pen i uh -huh. ten people were writing with pencils i was like oh my god this is amazing <laughs> like uh -huh. Uh -huh. So it was wow. a totally different experience of, of, um, yeah, just like relationship to, to education and to, to knowing things and, and, um, yeah, I think it, it released a lot of the experience of kind of needing to get it, to get it right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm really glad I asked because, uh, and thank you for sharing because, uh, it's just just so wildly different from my own childhood. And it's like, I can imagine what that might have been like if I'd been in your shoes. And it sounds like it was just like the reality for you, given your circumstances, was just like, I, yeah, I couldn't have imagined the things you said. So it's, it's just really, um, it, it feels precious to hear from you about that. Um, I could imagine that being yeah, just a very, very vulnerable time of your life. And so, so thank you for sharing it, yeah. Yeah, I appreciate you asking. Hmm. So fast forwarding a bit, I'd be curious to ask, um, with this knowledge integration program that you did at University of Waterloo, what would you say the skills are that you walked away with from your education there? Oh. Um... One of the the biggest things that I that oriented like why I went to university in the first place was to um, of course like you do the degree and you and you learn things but for me it was the the people that I was in relationship uh, with and specifically the knowledge integration program there was only twenty about twenty of us like in the entire class and like 80 of us in the entire program we knew all our professors by first name like we went to barbecues at their at their at their house and and um <laughs> we were the first the first class that was taught by a particular professor and he was like and it was his first class ever and he was like wild haired and like trying to figure it out we all dressed up as him for halloween in that first year and then became his like twitter banner um it was very it was very like meaningful to have so much connection and community the skills in particular because of that that like amount of safety i think that could happen and connection and co-learning together in the process there were so many um like 
building blocks of what it means to actually collaborate and work with other people that were built uh, from there. One of the core courses, because there's like core courses and, and courses that you can take in other faculties. One of the core cor core courses was, um, I think it was theory of knowledge, but it was, it was uh, taking a look at different, like even um, feminist theories and how we think about knowledge, how to take different perspectives. What does intersectionality mean and how does that play into uh, our, uh, like how, how we know things, um, how we come to be knowing um, things in epistemology and seeing that even from different um, from different perspectives from like physics to uh, to mathematics to like sciences um, and having a lot of that that um, orientation to perspective and how to and how to work with other people taking that um, as a as a uh, as a mindset but also as like a skill that you then that you then move move forward with um one of the core projects of the of the program there's two in particular uh, the first one that you do in your third year is um at the end of second year the entire cohort and the entire class goes to a european city for 10 days to tour museums and to tour exhi exhibits uh, because then all of third year is then a spent building a museum exhibit from scratch like you get together with with people sometimes it's randomly assigned sometimes it's like a, a, a process of getting a group together around a specific topic, different ways of doing it. And then you actually work with these people for eight months from from nothing to physical walls that had to be painted by you, didactics and things like that. Um, what a freaking powerful thing to do, like to mm -hmm. actually see nothing, like nothing and to have an, an exhibit that people walk through, that people experience. I still talk to it talked about it to, to this day and it's so relevant to like what Malcolm is doing because the entire project was, was about trust and how do we have trust relationships with other people through objects such as mm. uniforms, um, keys and passwords, um, uh, like stickers or, or like the certifications. But the thing that I still to this day kind of um, hold on to is that my group was extremely diverse. We had so many different opinions and views and we had so much freaking conflict. Mm. We mm. had so much conflict, but none of it was ever personal. Mm -hmm. Like there was no attacking one another in it. Like we, we were discussing what like font type to use. Like there's, there is so many ways that you can really get, get stuck into putting yourself into and putting your like personal um, self and, and identity and ego into something. And I was very like conflict averse and felt like I needed to take on the world myself or, or didn't know how to trust people. And that project made me um, really stretch me and all of us to see that that conflict can actually be so productive and how to work with other people who are different, how to communicate in a way that takes another person's perspective, that hears what they're saying, that actually um, orients more to the relationship first than to the thing that we're trying to accomplish because relationships, relationships are key. I don't know if you'd agree with that, but relationships are key and they're the the they're the thing to be cared for in order to create something mm. together. Mm -hmm. mm. I think that's one of the most powerful, like powerful lessons that I have and, and skills. It, it's an actual skill, but it's so hard to, to, to market or, or to talk about. Um, Yeah, I think those are there's there's a lot more, but kind of the the knowledge integration uh, program to me was like the opportunity to connect with so many people and and also the skill to really um, take ownership of my own experience. What is it that I want to to be doing? What I want to be learning? Um, what's where is the curiosity leading me? Um, and then to kind of sticking with that curiosity and and seeing it as a as a like to have a relationship with it and to see what happens and to be in in conversation with others um others about it as mm. well that were kind of like also very curious um i this this year will be our five year like your reunion of the of the program and every single year some of us have met which is huge mm. it's like 
and it was so funny we met together last uh last september and it's just like nothing has changed over the past <laughs> four years like we started mm. playing uh we're still the people that we are but kind of have kind of grown and it's so special to have that kind of community that i feel like i can i can call to i can call a, a favor or a connection at at any point mm. mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm. again sort of fast forwarding a bit when you were in Toronto's equivalent of Wall Street, and you were working this this sort of finance oriented job. You described yourself as being like, yeah, sort of like unexpectedly miserable, right? Like you thought you'd made it, and like <laughs> you're going to be really happy, and then you're like, no, I'm miserable. And I wonder how you would describe now, looking back on that experience, like why would you say you were miserable? I want to make sure I don't go into like, and the people were this way and the things were happening and on all of this, which I think they're all relevant. It's a context, but part of the, the miserableness was have not, not being true and listening to what is, to what was and is really important to mm -hmm. me, what was really important to me, um, at the time um i i i have a journal and i keep a i keep a i've been keeping a journal for for years now and and after i quit i was looking back on these on these journal entries and reading them back i realized like how did i not know i wanted something different specifically because one of my favorite things when i talk to people about when they're when they're unhappy and what is it that i want um oftentimes people say i don't know what i want which is absolutely, absolutely fair. When I ask my favorite follow-up questions, like, what are you envious of? Like, what are you mm. jealous of? Mm -hmm. um, because we think of that as a negative emotion that kind of pushes, you want to push away as far as you can because it's it's wrong to be feeling like that. But as in so many things such as anger um, or, or hurt, uh, jealousy, envy, envy um, has signal in it. And if we tune to the signal, it feels really important. Um, I was envious of my friend that had her own company. I was like, mm. she can do whatever she wants. And mm. like it, there is so much uh, like freedom and capacity to express herself um, that I think I was deeply missing in, in the work that I was doing. Um, there was also a way that um, like how the company was structured and how like the social games were played um, were not ones that I was interested and playing mm -hmm. um funnily um i think i was really good at them um mm. but felt quite drained from from the experience of playing that game uh i think there are far better games that we can play like i want to play games just not particularly those ones mm -hmm. um and there was also a way that um i was very constricted by by fears and what I thought I should do, what I thought I had to do. Uh, before I quit my job, I was like, I recognized that I had so many fears in myself and they were all in my head. They had like, I had all had opposing views and perspectives. So I sat down on my bed, pulled out like a sticky note pad and wrote out every single thing that I'm scared about, like on a separate sticky note from like, my parents will think I'm a failure if I mm. quit my job. Mm. What am I going to do with this car that I just bought with my sister? I'm going to leave my sister with it. Uh, and she'll be angry at me. People will think like I, I'm a, like a flake and I don't know what to do. I'm gonna not going to have any money. I'm going to like never find anything that I like. I felt so relieving to have all of them all laid out mm. in front of me. And recognizing that some of them, some of them are true. I think it's so important for us to see our fears and recognize that that they're that they're real, um, because there's again signal in them. But we are paralyzed, thinking so many so many steps ahead. Um, and some of them I just didn't didn't know. But what was I? What was the cost of being paralyzed in that? In in kind of the, by those by those fears was something that I I thought was far more worth it to, to try something, to try something different. And uh, funnily enough, um, again, funnily enough, 
I, uh, when I told my parents I quit my job and then like I started a business, they celebrated. They've never been happier oh, for oh, me. They're both oh, entrepreneurs. So like when oh, I started my business, they're like, yes, this is uh -huh. amazing. They're still my favorite people to go to for oh, any like business advice. Uh -huh. And I got my first client where Polish is like shots for everyone. Uh -huh. And I was like, oh, this is totally different than what I thought it was going to be. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, the car thing, my sister ended up going to China. She's uh -huh. like, she left me with the car. And I was like, whoa. <laughs> All right. And I she's ended going up to China. She's going, going to China. Uh -huh. So like it's it 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 worked out so much and it's and it's so valuable for me that I wrote out these fears that I was afraid of that like they're they're still somewhere in my drawer where I still have them stacked on top of one another. But uh, like to look at them and be like I remember being afraid of that. I remember being so paralyzed by thinking my parents were going to think all these things about me and some parents do. But to have this like contrast like this super contradicting knowledge right in front of me it's just like okay next time i'm afraid of something like you never know how it's going to turn out right right wow wow oh, i'm so happy for you that uh your parents were so supportive and it worked out so well for you and uh yeah part of the reason i asked about this question is like i look back on similar junctures of my life and mm. yeah i think i've come to my own story about those sorts of situations that like um yeah basically there, there's like a misalignment of values or ethics or yeah. you know what you want and who you want to be and you're in a situation where you can't act according according to your values or like something like that and so I was just kind of curious to hear how you would describe it to see if it sort of matched that that yeah. framework and it sounds like what I heard was that you really valued like autonomy and independence and being able to structure your own direction you know kind of like you had it you know, the University of Waterloo, for example, and yeah. that you're missing that and, uh, you know, less about the people or the systems or something and more just like you weren't going to be able to do work where you were going to flourish in that way is kind of what I heard. Yeah, that's that hit the nail on the head. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. and another thing was my my work was my entire life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like I, mm -hmm. I, I commuted to work every single day. So it was like three hours because it was an hour and a half one way, an hour and a half the other and like my entire life was work and mm -hmm. i uh, one of the things that i that i that i learned and how i restructured my life is like my work is not the center of my life like mm -hmm. i am the center of it and my work is just an expression mm -hmm. of it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. how do you hold that balance now uh, like what is that actually like for you yeah oh it's a constant learning process mm -hmm. um It's, there is so much value that I get. So it feels like there's a loop of, of like, I put energy in, but I also get so much energy out of it. Um, the balance, I, I, the most challenging thing for me is like, when I do, this is something that I've been recently thinking about and, and orienting to is like, it feels like there is my my selfish things that I do, of which coaching is one of them, actually, mm. and my work is one of them. And on the other side is relationships. Mm. And I feel like that's the trade-off between between the two that I have to constantly be making in some way and kind of managing. Because um, I think there's a parts of, part of me that believes that I have to be available uh, for other people mm. and like want to be supportive, want to be like supporting the process, asking questions. Uh, but it can often mean then I like put myself and therefore my work on on kind of like only do base, only do the base thing of it to to feel like I've taken care of it and then I have to make myself available. Mm. So I've been orienting differently to kind of creating more space for myself and see what emerges uh, from it rather than being focused on just like what tasks do I complete, but like giving myself the space to to play around, to play with ideas, to play with possibilities um, and then see and, and kind of make the flip of, of caring that's caring for myself and caring for relationships. Mm. Um, and being also being uh, transparent with other people that like this is this is space space for me and and um how they can co-care with me for mm. for that um yeah i think i think i love also coaching because it's such a broad category that i can definitely express myself and be doing things that work better mm. for 
for uh for me in particular like i love talking that's why i love being on podcasts mm -hmm. and talking to people and making connections versus like needing to i'm i like writing but writing posts on like instagram or social media isn't something that has felt very um like meaningful or quite connecting which means i i can just express and create and design things in my way and have that autonomy in a way that feels like it's an expression uh a further expression of of, of who i am hmm. can you give me like a, a a specific or concrete example of this kind of balance that you're finding, like how you clear space for yourself and what, what that might look like practically? Yeah. So there is, there's like one version of the day mm -hmm. where I wake up and then I like hang around with, with Eric and we have breakfast together and by the end and like talk or think about the day or projects or like things that, that we're doing, going to dancing or things like that. And then I might think like, okay, I have to like prepare for the calls called tomorrow. And so I sit down and like spend 30 minutes to an hour, just like focusing on that. But it feels like it's like a, it's a small thing, small, um, cl like cleaved out space. And then afterwards, like maybe Sarah and Malcolm and, and, and Eric and I have a conversation around, around housing or, um, Sarah might be like wanting help with thinking about about something um and so i spent doing that and maybe going on a walk and talk to talk to a friend so it feels like a lot of my energy is then spent in like connection with with other other people and by the time kind of the evening comes i'm a morning person in evening i can't really work very um well or creatively um and that's really meaningful and that there is meaning of it but there but if i continue that doing that very if I do continue to act consistently, it's actually draining for my system. And the other, the, the other, another type of day that I can imagine, and there's the, the balance is interweaving it together where I wake up earlier and then give myself like two or three hours of, of coaching work. And I think about what are the, like, what has, Hmm. how am I thinking long-term about what I, what impact I want to create in the world and how does that connect to this, this very moment? Maybe reaching out to podcasts that and reaching out to people that I want to connect with. Um, having calls like this feel connected to, to that and giving myself more of that, more of that space and kind of allowing and then going on a walk and then coming back and still having the space to kind of tune into, to the world. It feels like a world of, of, uh like it exists in 3d for me it's like it's being pulled into different in different directions and when i'm with people it then becomes like the world with other people and so when when there's that space it's like i can create this world for me that i can that i can interact with that i can have ideas or pull do research on um and then and then maybe at like 5 or 6 p.m. then connecting with with other people and like coming back from like an adventure of a day of which there's like so many things that I thought and maybe we'll then have a conversation or, or watch something that feels feels meaningful. Um, and the the balance for me is is um, making sure that I'm caring for for myself and for the relationships. Um, equally isn't a good way, but in a way that feels aligned. Mm -hmm. me. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. I think the way that you're framing this is like, I, I found over the years, I've found my own way of being aligned on these issues and the way that you're describing sounds like maybe a different solution to the same suite of problems. And so like, I was mm. just curious to hear more of, of that. Um, yeah. So coming back to the coaching in particular, um, you know, you said when you signed up for this coaching program, like you thought, oh, maybe this will just be for me. It's like an interesting thing to learn. And then you ended up doing coaching and that's your business now. And I'm curious, like you knew that you liked working with people, but how did it end up happening that you decided to do sort of like career coaching in particular? Mm -hmm. One um how i heard the the advice of kind of like what to coach on is um a coach is someone um and how i like to think about it, a coach is someone that's just like one step ahead 
mm. of somebody else. Mm. Um, not like giant X steps forward. Um, and they're also not someone that like, I never give advice. I mm. think giving advice is actually uh, like a misstep in that. Like we don't know the other other person what they're going through. We can provide our own experience or we can kind of guide the process. But being like, you should do this is uh, I think an, an, an assumption of, of something. That, that's a misstep in the coaching relationship in particular, not in general. Like advice is not bad. In general. Yeah, yeah. Adv advice is not bad. No, no, no. <laughs> advice is not bad. But it's just like when, when you're trying to um, frame it as like, given what you said, you should do this. It's, mm. it's, it's, I think it's an invalidation of what the, I, I come from the place of the person has everything that they need to know mm. already. Mm. Um, it's a, it's a process of, of, of exploring that or even giving different tools and perspectives on the, on the, uh, on the experience, mm -hmm. uh, that's, that's there. Um, I going through the process of quitting my job and kind of like how miserable I was feeling was an, uh, was along with moving to moving to Canada and, and other things felt like such a big shift in my life that I wished I had someone to help me through. Mm -hmm. um, and I think it's an experience and, and I know that's an experience of many people find a lot of challenge with. And so when I started off, I like wasn't very clear what I was going to do. I like I know I wanted to work with people who felt really dissatisfied with the work that 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 they were doing and wanted mm. to find something that felt more aligned um, with with who they are and what is it that I want that they want to do and even find out what is it that they want to be doing in mm -hmm. the first place. Um, so it kind of got refined over time as I figured out who I wanted to work with because first because first I was like, oh, I want to work with people who are like just out of school to like anybody who's going into retirement, like anywhere in between. And it's like, that's a wide range of people in all different areas of life. And it's just like, it's a lot. Mm. Um, and over time I've refined, and also I've, I've was, I've been very lucky in, in the people that I've also worked with are absolutely amazing. Um, in that, um, I realized that something that I really want to hone into is, is the, um, moments of transition between different phases of mm. our work life uh, because they feel like and, and I take them as openings of like there's something possible that's that's different there and if we're able to to lean into it um before it kind of kind of closes up and and, and again becomes the path that we are that we are stepping on which is not wrong at all there are times when we need expansion and contraction mm. um I don't know if you've ever seen one of those like toy uh toys where it just like it, it scrunches up and you expand it becomes this, like gigantic gigantic ball and how valuable expansion and and contraction the cycle of it um is that if we get just get stuck in in contraction um that could feel really tense but if we only um expand there isn't then the the flow of it like if we only took a deep breath in there isn't the deep breath, deep mm. breath out. um and so career, it, it, I'm very hesitant because I don't, I don't do career coaching. Mm. Like I won't tell, I, I'm not here to help you how to get like a new job. Like I'm not, I don't help people with their resumes. I don't help people with like interview skills. I don't help people with like how to get a better promotion or how to, how to, how to do that. What I work with people about is, is recognizing, um, is recognizing what do they deeply care about. It's usually people that are quite unhappy in, in where they are right now and kind of getting to to the core of what is it that they're unhappy by starting with what what do they deeply care about. Mm. It's it's mind boggling and I know this from my own experience how how many of us don't like take time to check in what is it that's important because we're in such a rush all the time. Like it's mm. so easy to just keep doing the next thing and the next thing and the next thing um, instead of checking in with what, what do I care about? <laughs> because it, it, sometimes it can be really scary to say I care about this because it might mean that we've been making a mistake. <laughs> mm. <laughs> or we've been going down a direction that's, that's not for us. Mm. Um, and so the first thing that I do is I actually have the values exercise on, on my website, which I know that you've, you've checked out. And the story of that is that uh, it's so funny to me 
I was scrolling through, I think Facebook one time and I saw a version of it on like a Facebook ad and I downloaded it years before I started the business. And it was single-handedly one of the most valuable exercises mm. I've ever done in my entire life. Um, and I've done the values exercise probably like six or seven times since then. And the most meaningful part is that I've shared it with other people in my life. Mm. And then we talked about what's the difference between that, like to understand another person, what are they caring about? And what's the process of the, of the values exercise? Because for me, it's not only what's important to you, it's what's not important to you. Mm. That is equally valuable to recognize and mm. to, and to go through the process of saying no to something before we're able to say like, hell yes, like this is definitely what I want in mm -hmm. my life. I also see values as, um, it was interesting. I had a client who like did the values exercise and, and like a year later, did the values exercise again. And all of their values were like evolved versions of the first value. Mm, wow. It was like a Pokemon ev evolution <laughs> that happened <laughs> on each of them. And they recognized that too. So like moved from, I think, community or something to like deep intimacy and just like mm. a deepening of these values. So I mm. see them more as like, what are we deeply yearning for our life? like mm. our life to, to look like and to be like, um, and that can evolve over time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so one of the, one of the first things that I work with, with people about is like getting clear about what their, their values are, what do they care about? And sometimes it's off, it has oftentimes been one of the most valuable things that we ever, ever do mm. together. Mm. Um, and from then, uh, from there also kind of talking to people, what's their relationship to work? If work was a person, what would your relationship be? What would work say about you? What would you say mm. about work? Mm. Um, <laughs> would, what's your parents' relationship to work? I have, a, I have another client that like, we talked about this and they were like, I love work. It's mm. amazing. My parents loved work. This was great. And like their issue was not at, with work at all. It was, they were in like a new position and, and they were feeling anxiety around not having a vision essentially and not knowing what they were going to learn there so bringing it back to themselves so it wasn't at all about work mm. um and kind of diving into what are our subconscious and conscious beliefs that we have about these things that lead our our behaviors mm. um so it's 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 more oriented to that and then kind of based on that what what things do we want to gently shift and experiment with and what's something to try and then to gather information about that and then to try again so kind of move forward in a in a I can't follow the universe. Like you can't get it wrong. If you mm. get it, if you get it wrong, it's just data. Mm -hmm. There is no, there is no, I have this like image in my head of there is no doing, failing or succeeding. It's like you're doing and learning. And it's an iterative loop that mm -hmm. keeps, keeps going. Mm. Beautiful. Yeah. I love that. I mean, that, that, again, that shift has been very useful for me. So it's beautiful to hear you express that in the context of people sort of structuring their lives and structuring their work. And yeah. Um, you said you don't give advice, but I imagine that there are things that you find yourself maybe repeatedly suggesting or like things that like sort of themes in the work that you do, you know, I mean, you mentioned the values exercise and sort of asking about relationship, someone's relationship with work, but, um, are there any things that you find yourself repeatedly saying or, suggesting or anything like that? Mm -hmm. There is a couple of, um, yeah, there's a couple of things that, 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 um, appear over and over again. Um, something that, that comes up quite often is, uh, around boundaries. And boundaries more being about um, capacity to say um, yes or no in relationships mm. and recognizing where are the, where are, yeah, becoming clear with what is it that, that you want then creates an opportunity to care about the things and communicate about the things that, 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 that are important to us that can then interface with, with other people. But until we have that clarity about what is it that we care about, it's quite easy to then be, be porous mm. and kind of give away a lot of, a lot of, um, our own agency. 
hmm. to 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 others um that might feel like it, it might just be larger and i often work with people who are like quite caring and want to to do a lot and they're they're very um like excited to be creating things the people that i work with um one of the characteristics i think that just like combines them they just like want to want to work on their personal experience and want to work with other people and want to create impact in the world um which is like one of the reasons why i love the work that i do because i know it has ripple effects um, mm -hmm. moving forward but those um so one of the things that we often talk about is the like yes no yes structure mm. of like being able to say no in a way that honors the relationship mm -hmm. but honors ourselves at the same time what it, so that structure is like you're saying yes to the relationship no to something in particular and uh, yeah what, what do you mean by that exactly yeah so it, uh, it comes from a book called the power of positive no Mm -hmm. and the the idea is that you're saying like yes to something that you're deeply caring about no to the particular thing that they're asking about because it's not aligning with what you're both caring about and then provide and then providing like an alternative or like a yes i care for the relationship but i'm mm -hmm. going to give um however makes sense for me um at that at that time mm -hmm. what's a way that that might come up in the coaching relationship that you have, like that someone might, that that might be relevant to someone's, what someone's working on. Yeah. So it could be that, um, it's oftentimes people get a lot of tasks mm. on their, on their plate and somebody's mm. asking them for, for things and a particular client, um, they were asked to be participate in all of these interviews and like interview, interview people sit on the panel mm. and they're like, that's not my, that's not my job. Like that's, that's not, I, I, used to do that, but I don't, I don't think it makes sense for me to do that given the role that I have and the things that I care about. So instead of like either saying yes and sacrificing their time, but by feeling resentful of it and, and stressed or saying no and creating a, a wedge in the relationship um, that they actually deeply care about, there's a way to, to respond of like, yes, I first maybe getting curious about like what is that person actually wanting and caring about is it that mm. they don't feel like they don't have support is it that they need someone with technical knowledge to to be in that in that interview so getting curious um but first saying like yes i care about you having the support that you need for this for this mm -hmm. process um no i will not sit in the interview uh, but how about um, i send you a list of questions and like what i would be looking at for these different people so you can feel like you have the support and then you're we're, you're wel we're welcome to have like a conversation with me afterwards mm. that would feel that would feel different mm. that makes sense it's been two years now and going on your third starting your third year that you've been doing this coaching and i wonder what things you've had to learn or ways that you've had to grow throughout that time i like your questions you have good <laughs> questions one of the biggest learnings for me um has been going back to one of the things that that i mentioned at the beginning um was uh, about this experience of feeling like i can't fall out of the universe especially around uh coaching um there are cycles that happen there are times where i feel like i don't know what i'm doing at all or there have been times of that and and questioning my own um capacity to be doing that um but it feels like a cycle after after a low or kind of not knowing what i'm i'm doing there's always an op there's always an opportunity or some kind of exciting project and and thing that that comes up another thing i've had to learn was um like a grounded confidence in my in my capacity and working with imposter syndrome of like i did as a new coach like i don't know what i'm doing like these people in um in in positions that i've never been done in companies that i've have never worked at and how to how to see the value that i can bring to people and really recognize that that there is there's value that i'm that i'm providing 
um, and for that to be the the meaning that I'm that I'm getting out of out of uh, the work that I do. Um, there's also been work in like actually hearing when people are saying like this is really mm. meaningful and this is really important, uh, really important to me. Um, I've had to learn a lot of like very basic things. Like I made my website myself. So like, mm. how do you even do that? Mm. Or I um, did great. It's a good website. Thank you. I think so too. My UX design coming, uh -huh. coming in handy. Uh -huh. um, that's another thing. Like I hold that everything that I've ever done is actually useful. Mm -hmm. Like it's going totally. to have, it's going to have a use. And so every single thing that I do, I don't know how it's going to fit into my life. I don't know who it's going to help. Um, Cause I hold that my, I asked this, this question to a lot of people like what do you think the purpose of us is on this planet like why why do humans exist why how is your life relevant to it and for me um, when i first thought about this it's like we exist for each other mm -hmm. like to help each other and 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 to support to lift each other up and that's that's what i do and this is um comes out in a way when i meet someone like there is a feeling of like i'm i'm supposed to be in their life in some way like, I don't know, am I supposed to make a connection, tell them something, maybe someone I know will, will support them. And I know that like, it could be that I'm supposed to be in their life for like an instant, only that very moment, or it could be decades. Mm. Um, but knowing that everything that I have might be of use to someone, I might be, and I, and I might never know how mm. that, how that might, might be helpful. So I see every, every single thing as a gift. It's a very mm. valuable way to orient to, to many of the world of the life's challenges um, that come up. Mm. I feel like there's so many things in this conversation that you've shared that um, I really resonate with and feel like, uh, like, yeah, like, like we've learned a lot of the same lessons from our lives and, you know, like what you said about, um, you know, our, our purpose being to help each other and, um, this bit about people coming into our lives, you know, for a reason or something and, um, you know, coming into someone's life for a reason. And also, um, what you said about like all the gifts being useful and, uh, you know, even, yeah, I mean, just I, at least on my end of this, the equation, it's like some of the things that I've learned are like very strange and how they fit together was not obvious. And then it's like, Oh, this, I can use all of this. <laughs> so here we go. Yeah. Uh, you know, that like brief detour where I was like a professional programmer for like three months, like, all right, now I can do this if I need to, uh, you know? So um, anyway, uh, yeah, I'm just, I don't know, it's, it's kind of interesting to look back historically in one's life and see how one arrived at these sort of lessons. And um, yeah, I don't know, like maybe, like, I feel like I could, I could ask you about each of them, but maybe just I'll pick one to start, like, how would you say you arrived at the sense that um, you come into someone's life for a reason, maybe for a moment, maybe for decades, or that, you know, or vice versa, that someone comes into your life in that way? Like, how did you arrive at that? What was that? How did you come to see that for yourself? What comes was like I think I'm just a huge hopeless romantic, uh -huh, like, and I just uh -huh. like want to have meaning and uh -huh. just like so much magic that can yeah. happen in in the world. Um, I think uh, what it is for me, it's it's uh, I don't know, it's like a tingling mm. in in some ways. There is like a towardsness that I feel towards this person that can sometimes feel so against everything that would actually make sense or like i don't understand what i would feel so connected and like vibe with that person mm. uh vibe with that person so much and it's the the and it's and it's the it's combined with with one of the things that i uh i know is one of my gifts and how eric described it recently is like mm. i'm not a i'm not a hyper connector like i don't know many people and connect them to each other I go deep in relationships, but it has, and that has meant that I've had relationships for, for a decade, like 
my sister describes that as one of my gifts that I can have have relationships for a very long time and feel connected in mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One of the things that you said in our conversation last week that you kindly wrote. Oh, did oh, I, did I, I, think, I, I think you cut out. Yeah, just for yeah. a minute. Okay. One of the things that you said in our conversation last week, which you kindly tweeted out afterwards was, uh, let me read it here. You said, end goal, leave this world held by a dense network of intimate and supportive relationships. Um, I felt a lot of alignment to that as well when you first said it to me. And I wonder, yeah, sort of a similar question of like, how did you arrive at that being one of your end goals or like one of your purposes in life? Like what's the sort of backstory behind that? Yeah. Um, the backstory is that I was having one of my many existential crises uh, hmm. around like what what do I do with my life? How do I, oh, it was actually like, how do I want to live my life? I arrived at a choice point. I think it was this, this February, beginning mm. of this February. I was coming out of um, like spending three months in, in, on the West coast, figuring out like, where's my next step. And I spent um, a month in, in Halifax in a really challenging, um, kind, of, kind of challenging group situation in in with with some friends and 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 relationships and i came home to hamilton which is like base but it's also one for the first time i came home where i came to my parents house and it felt like my parents house rather mm. than home or a baseline mm. and so it felt like i had a choice of like how do i choose to live my life now and it feels important in in what does that what does that mean mm. to me? Mm. And I, uh, writing in my journal, but also kind of like doing reflection in 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 space. So so creating mind maps and and asking questions is really is really important to me. And and one of these one of those days, I was sitting on my bed and like writing my journal, um, kind of orienting to all these different different parts. Um, and I, and I got in touch with this feeling of how important relationships are in my life. And, um, and how valuable it is for me. And I've like described this, this, this goal or articulated this goal in a variety of, of different ways over the years. I created like a 30 year vision of what do I want my my life to look like and one of those was to be like to be in a community of such supportive and caring people where we're where we're working together in a way that feels so so expressive of who we are but more than that it's just like there's so much intercon like connectivity and this like web of experiences uh, and of people connected together and in that that moment of existential crisis it it felt like that was the pillar that i came back to in in myself that the 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 way that i want to live my life is towards this end goal of having a dense and like dense i mean like like er like very dense relationship network and and this web of of deeply intimate and supportive um supportive relationships that are like interweaved together um because I see, I see it as like if there is, if there is a disturbance or resonance in in one node and one person, it like reverberates through the web. So how to care for the entirety of the, of of the web and, um, and and for me, it's it's not even to have that for me. It's like what will it mean to have such a network for every single person mm. interweaved through it? And I. Like, I love it. Like, I want to weave things. Weave has been such a, like, a thing, in, a word in my vocabulary, but it's not even a word. It's, like, how I see relationship building, how I see every single, like, meeting with a new person. It's, like, what's a thread that I can pull from there that I can, mm. like, weave together into this beautiful tapestry of, mm. of experience and, and connections and how do they interweave with other, with other people. Mm. 
Hmm. Yeah, I think, um, I don't remember how it came about, but um, well, so, so I want to just sort of surface in a little bit more detail, like two things that uh, maybe we could keep on the table in our, as we sort of shift into maybe a more conversational mode is like, one is what I became clear about, about my mm. own aspirations in our conversation last week. And second, what I became clear about, about you in our conversation last week. And um, uh, yeah, maybe it would be easier to start with that. Just um, so part of the conversation, I remember um, this is sort of how this became clear to me initially was You know, I we were sort of comparing notes about Eric in particular, and um, and you know, I think he's just such an interesting person. And I described to you kind of how I see him, and as you were describing him and how you see him, I saw both that you could clearly see the the, the beautiful, incredible things about him that I see, um, which I think are rare and and and. So it, like historically for me, were hard to discern, right? That I didn't see them the mm. first time I met him. And then mm. it took the podcast conversation I had with him to, I mean, you, you, you can go back and watch as you did and see me, it's sort of like dawning on me, like, wow, this person is amazing. Um, and uh, in this very specific way. And um, so you could see that about him and you added a lot of like nuance and detail and, mm. and specific flavor to that vision that were like things I could still hadn't seen about him. And, um, you know, I think some of that, of course, is like situational. Like I don't, I don't live with him. I'm not near him. I've spent only so many hours with him, but, um, I really appreciated the like texture that you were able to add to my understanding of him and, um, the like capacity of seeing that, you know, both we could see the same things and you could add more nuance. Um, and I want to ask you a question about that, but uh, uh, just I'll just surface the other thing, which is like yeah. in the conversation, I realized that like last year I had crystallized maybe like two endeavors that I was focusing on. It's like, oh, these are the two things I'm focusing on. And one of them was spreading love and kindness meditation. And one is sort of following my curiosity. And it's like the blog and the podcast and all of that. And, um, you know, just asking questions of the world basically and mm -hmm. in ways that make sense. And um uh, I realized in our conversation in a way that I hadn't realized before that like there's a third pillar, which is, you know, what, what I'm sort of right now calling like empowerment, which is, um, yeah, the same skill of discerning who people are, you know, like we talked about Eric, seeing what their gifts are and sort of giving them nudges towards becoming their fullest expression of themselves, mm -hmm. giving them nudges towards being of highest service in the world, like mm -hmm. being delighted in who they are. And the, and the whole, you know, we talked about like a whole suite of things that are involved in that sort of like pipeline of like what that actually takes. And, um, you know, there were things that I had done in this direction before, but I hadn't seen them as like a coherent effort in that mm -hmm. direction. And that became clear to me when I was talking to you. And I think partly occasioned by the capacities you're bringing to the conversation of, you know, uh, and the things you were sharing. And um, yeah, I would really love to dive into that vision with you in this conversation. And um, maybe just to start, like going back to what, what you saw in Eric or what you see in the people that you know that you're connected to with the clients that you work with, like, how do you, what's it like for you to discern who people are and what their gifts are? Like, what is that experience like for you? How do you do that? You do it. So how do you do it? Please tell me. <laughs> Respectfully, please tell, tell me. me how you do it. Tell me how you do it. I know you can do it. So that's not the question. The question is, how do you do it? Um, I think there's, I think there's actually even, uh, two parts to how do you do it mm -hmm, in mm -hmm. that there is something about discerning it, noticing it, and then there is communicating it. Perception and behavior. Perception and behavior. And there's perception and also the, then the leaning into the relating between both people, like putting it in the middle and then having the other person interact, mm -hmm. um, with it. Mm -hmm. And because I think a lot of people actually perceive a lot of the gifts that other people other people have but it's like how do you then interface it with um maybe what they're ready for mm -hmm. it's also interesting to 
and I want to, and I love that you're bringing in what our past conversation was around, around Eric and that there's also something so beautiful about like two people seeing someone mm -hmm. like that's even more magical than like you, sh you s seeing the person mm -hmm. and then giving kind of kind of like giving them the, the, the tidbit of what you recognize, but then comparing notes with somebody else that mm -hmm. can that can see it mm -hmm. um and then supporting them i love that now you've started the 100 questions for, <laughs> yes, for Aaron because of... of that i was like yes oh, yeah but just um, to give context um i think i think i said i wanted to be connecting to eric more and so mary's like oh um it basically it led to me realizing oh i could ask something mary said made me realize oh i could ask eric lots of questions and might as well make it 100 since i'm doing <laughs> uh lots of 100 thing challenges so uh, I can certainly can come up with a hundred questions for Eric. So here goes. Yeah. <laughs> well, and then to feed it back to Eric mm -hmm. and being like, that's, that's what's happening. It's like two people are collaborating on lifting you up. And mm -hmm. like, what does that create for someone to feel such a support of who they are and what they want to create in the world in the way that they maybe don't know how to do with themselves? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So going back to how, how do I do it? How do I see those <laughs> gifts? Um, that's a great question. If I had a great answer, maybe I'd be teaching it, which maybe this is, this is what is a part of it. Yes. Um, I feel like I don't, it's, I don't even have a particular, like I don't have like a step-by-step -step thing, mm -hmm. but what feels really present is like attunement mm -hmm. and actually listening to, and listening not only with what they're saying, but the, the things that they're not saying, um, the ways that, that, that they listen, what do they listen to? What do they pay attention to? Um, how do they pay attention? What kind of attention? Um, also how do they, uh, what are the things that light them up? Mm. Uh, there's nothing more, uh, like more deeply satisfying, exciting for me than like having experience of someone that doesn't like speak much or doesn't express just like monologue something mm. for for like a good 30 minutes or even uh -huh. just like an entire hour like if if someone is giving me their own version of a ted talk like mm. i that's my that's like <laughs> i know this is this is the thing mm -hmm. um and the more niche it is the mm -hmm. the better like to have just... that <laughs> Yeah, I just want to reflect as well. There's been a few points in the conversation where what you're describing now seems to have happened for you, including the thing you're saying now. Where you're just like, I don't, it looks like you're in love, frankly. Like, you're just like, <laughs> oh, I'm so happy to be answering this question. Like, just gen it, it appears to me to be genuine delight. I mean, maybe you're like secretly pissed off or like bored or something, but you look so alive right now. So yeah, is, is that your experience right now? That Oh, oh, yes. I, mm -hmm. this is, um... I have a hard time containing emotions. Oh yeah, don't do so, that on this show. <laughs> <laughs> so if I was, I was, if I was feeling pissed off, there's experiences uh -huh. that I've had in conversations that just like yeah. I ooze black, like black rage, mm. like. Ugh. Um. So you'd know. Mm -hmm. I definitely yeah, feel yeah, delighted to be. <laughs> I don't want to be uh, presuming too much, but I, you know, certainly presenting like you're enjoying answering this question so it, i just thought it was interesting that like the thing you're describing is also seems to me to be happening for you right now so mm -hmm. anyway don't let me interrupt further yeah, yeah. well you gotta you... <laughs> it takes one to know one kind mm -hmm. of thing like to have mm -hmm. the experience and recognize the 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 um, like what's going on for somebody else um i think there's also an expansion of like what are gifts we think of like gifts as maybe particular skills or, or, um, like wakes people, like things that are more legible. And I think there's also a way of, of attuning and like really taking the person in as they are before you assume anything about them. Just like starting from the point of like, I don't know anything. And so help me, f like, help me fill in the, fill in the details and like mm. introducing that, enticing that to happen rather than try to, um, have a, have a model or even have like, have this person in front of you. And then just like constantly try to match them to something instead of being like, help me draw a picture of you, help mm. me create a painting of you. 
-hmm. can then actually see see the person and their and their experience rather than trying to impose something something mm -hmm. on them mm -hmm. And there's something also just like about listening, just like some people just say what they like and what they're good at. And just mm -hmm. like, just go listen to them and be like, look, look at the thing, look at the thing you're doing and reflected, reflected back mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there does seem to be a part of like listening to what someone literally says about what they care about or who they are. And then there's also like a discerning of uh, at least in my experience, things that aren't obvious to someone that's like not like it's like written on their face, but they can't see it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's mm -hmm. like this is who I am. And because their eyes are here and looking out, they can't see the thing. And yeah. so there is a skill of seeing what they're not saying because they don't even see it themselves. Um, yeah. And, you know, I mean, sometimes they they might know it about themselves or have learned it or something, but like often a lot of the value, I think comes from that of like just reflecting like oh I, I see you doing this thing that mm -hmm. you maybe haven't seen that you're doing you know yeah um I think something that also um as you're speaking that came up for me is is a telltale sign for me is like that I really appreciate that about them yes um I was uh, and, and there's this comes up to me in like even a different format in my in my family when we were during the the COVID pandemic, both of my sisters were home and I was home. It's like five adults in a house. It's not made for five people. <laughs> um, it yep. was a time. Yep. But I remember it kind of like being annoyed with my family. And I was like, no, like I really want to have a different perspective on it. So I sat down and I have like this gigantic notebook and I wrote, like I put a heading for every single one of my family member and I wrote out what I really appreciate mm. about them. So beautiful. Wow. Like my, my, for my dad, I was like, he just is so unapologetically himself. Like he's just like in ways that are probably like annoy parts of him. Just like, wow, he's doing such a good, like, that's amazing that there's something that he's so capable of doing. Or my sister that I feel like she just like never agrees with anything. It's like, wow, she's doing such a fantastic job. Like knowing what she wants and doesn't want and communicating that in a way that, that is able to hold her ground and then give capacity for other relationships and for other things to happen. So just like really take in like, what do I, what do I appreciate about them? If I don't have the filter of like, how does this relate to me? And what does mm. this annoy me about? It's like, what do I deeply appreciate um, about them? Mm. Mm -hmm. What are some of the ways that like, as you do discern, I mean, we talked earlier about the like perception side of it, of just seeing what their gifts are. And then you're like, oh, you have to present it in a, a skillful way and you know what they're ready for and that kind of thing mm -hmm. like what's that like for you how do you do that mm -hmm. it's a it's a thing to learn for me because part of me is just like I see this thing I'm gonna tell you right away about it but just mm. like oftentimes it's not the the space there is a um there is the act of like context artistry mm and how to create and craft contexts that um, that like touch into when would be really meaningful to share to share that um, that 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 piece and in what context will that piece uh, land in? Um, with my family, uh, I think we're just like sitting around the table as we as we would and. Um, I don't know how this came about, but like I came out and I shared this entire thing. My family like was just a little weirded out by it because they <laughs> mostly are weirded out by things like that. From me. But they were also really appreciative. And it was just mm. like a family space to be doing um, doing that. And then I've spoken to also kind of one on one with them. So what context are created um, around sharing it um, in my coaching? Um, I think it's like finding opportunities finding opportunities that that I feel attuned to like this I think this makes sense to share that to share this right now mm. um and to and to feel moments where it actually would would make sense like I've made a really big effort to be like Tosh and I like see you doing the thing or, like after I watched you and Eric to be like wow I see what you were doing right there I so appreciate it I like see the the things that you're you're expressing um to give it like a ground, a grounding context, because then people can then see their own gift and be like, oh, I'm doing, I'm doing mm -hmm. that. I can see it. Mm -hmm. 
in the context of your coaching, what makes it a good time to share these things and what makes it not a good time? There is, I think, a delicate balance of um, acknowledging, like, the gifts that someone has, um, like, in the midst when there's something challenging happening for them, not having as, like, but look how great you're doing, like, look how awesome this is going, that might invalidate the experience that they're having mm. in that in that uh moment if it's kind of framed in a particular way rather than giving them space of like yeah this is really challenging um um and to there are oftentimes people that might not be able to take in their gifts um because of the place that they're at or be like well no actually because of this that's not really true mm -hmm. um or well it's it's just luck or like an imposter syndrome coming in so um those are all those are all real experiences that people have and how to find ways to not like be in in like opposition be like no i actually see this on see this in you but rather um maybe in that case even helping that person see them themselves mm -hmm. instead of telling them it's kind of like i'm not giving advice or being like this is what i see but like helping someone come to see it themselves mm. and rather pointing them in direction like what do you see recognized as what you did here that mm. felt really meaningful and valuable um what would someone else that that is kind of seeing the situation appreciate um about you mm. um, it's like asking them a question to so that they can consider and reflect and uh, for themselves yeah yeah it's far more powerful um to like nudge and nurture right i i hold that there are times when it's far more powerful to have the person come to see it mm -hmm. um themselves and it sounds like especially if there's sort of i mean at least in my experience i've, I've experienced these things as sort of like defense mechanisms of like yeah. people sometimes really don't want to hear these kinds of compliments they're like oh no absolutely not for a variety of reasons and so kind of what i'm hearing comparing it with my own experience is like oh if someone seems to have these kinds of defense mechanisms it's going to be more powerful to like give them an occasion to see it for themselves mm -hmm. through asking a question rather than like trying to bypass their defense mechanisms. Yeah, because it's just, it reminds me of that, of that um, compound that if you like, you hit it hard, it becomes, it becomes solid. Mm. But if you gently kind of, um, if you like drop something into it gently, then it just like, it becomes liquid. So mm. rather than like forcing something, I need you to see how great you are being like, what are, what is the context that we can create such that you can see? Mm you can see that yourself. Hmm. I want to try that sometime because I think the strategy that I've taken is much more like this, although I, I have just de like developed some nuance with it where like oftentimes what I will do is just simply reflect what I see the person mm -hmm. doing of like, mm -hmm. oh, it seems to me like you didn't hear what I said or, oh, it seems to me like you didn't, like you were deflecting this compliment, but you know, I'm actually giving you a compliment. So I would like yeah. it if you received it. And that, that actually works reasonably well, but I feel like it would be useful for me to be able to um, uh, do this sort of question approach. Yeah. I think just giving an opportunity to have different um, modalities to go mm -hmm. about it. I think honestly, the, the experience of like, no, I think you really need to hear this. You're awesome. It's mm -hmm. just like, there's something that also break, can break through mm -hmm. being like, wow, this person really cares, mm -hmm. like really cares about it. I've heard you described by Eric, but many other people as like everyone's number one fan. Yeah. And like, you just gotta have someone cheering in the, in the, in the bleachers, no matter like how, how uh -huh. you're doing. Yeah, screaming loudly and wildly <laughs> and maybe babbling incoherently about it, but yeah. No, I mean, it takes people a few times to hear it. Like the first time mm -hmm. you say something like this, it often, I, I think it's because uh, this is just the image I'm getting as we talk about this is like, people's gifts are so core to who they are that like yeah it's just really hard to see it when it's like central at the center of who you are and so like sometimes it like even if someone's willing to hear it, it it can take time to like really reflect and show them what mm -hmm. you're seeing and care and repetition and you know saying it kindly and that sort of thing but but like to the extent that i've been able to mirror that to someone it's it's um yeah, it, it changes someone's life. And then, as you said, there's ripple effects of like, 
it, it just then they're going to be able to help so many other people and um it feels worth reflecting as well like part of i think part of what I bring to a situation like this is sort of a, a, a specific mental model of who people are and what their lives are for that like mm. helps me discern this sort of thing, which is like, um, I mean, it seems like, yeah, like one of the frames I bring is just like, and this is not something to take literally, but just like, what if I saw everyone in the world as a bodhisattva? You know, I see myself as a bodhisattva. That's why I have my name, that's why I have my sash. Like what if I saw everyone in the same way that I see myself and see mm. other people that I've known that have these qualities. And in that way, it's like, well, everyone wants to be of service. Everyone wants to help other people. Everyone wants to be of benefit. Um, and then some people are more or less clear about how they're going to be of benefit and, or what they can do to be of benefit. And so if I can find someone and reflect to them, like, this is what I see you doing that's of benefit that you may not already not notice about yourself, um, like people respond to that because they do want to be of service. They they know that they're, yeah, I, the way I see it, like our deep happiness comes from being connected into the world in a way that's both joyful for us and of benefit to others. And it's like, mm -hmm. if you can help find someone find that sweet spot, um, it's, it's, it's happy for them. <laughs> they're delighted, <Yeah. laughs> you know, and, and it's a benefit to the world. So it's just like a win-win thing mm -hmm. for everyone so like I I'm always looking at people through that frame of like how does this person want to be of service what are the gifts that they're giving and like can I help them with that can I reflect that to them in some way like it's not always the specific thing we're talking about of seeing other people's gifts sometimes it's like just very practical like how do I how do I get this person nonprofit funding like they're going to need yeah. a budget of half a million dollars how do we do that <laughs> like how do we get from here to there they already know what they're who they are and what their gifts are and so on it's like we need to get them some money like how do we do that <laughs> um yeah. so um yeah i think that's something i bring to these kinds of situations yeah i'm seeing i'm seeing what your like the gift thing is just like a, a sliver of like essentially the pipeline that mm -hmm. we that that you were you were gesturing and we talked about of of connecting people with the good that they can do in the world and like mm -hmm. how to do that that the how is can be a myriad of, of a variety of things of which everything that you've done up until now in your mm -hmm. life is is of service to that so it's just like it feels like there is actually fractals of it that you are that you are interfacing uh interfacing with so like there is there is how do you provide them the most service to the world with who you are and you do that by connecting other people to to be doing the things that will then create the most service um service in the world that's definitely the idea. And um, yeah, I feel like just talking to you about this both last week and today has like really crystallized this vision of what that could look like and what, what it would mean. I, I mean, the way I described it previously is like, oh, I'm doing this at like a level five or something and I could do it. I could see myself in 30 or 40 years doing it at like a level 50 mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. um, like what that might look like. And, um, you know, yeah, uh, I'm trying to think how to ask this, but hmm. just a second, bear with me here. Um, you take your time. I love silences. <laughs> yeah, there's kind of two levels that I'm having this conversation on and I suspect it's like the same conversation we'll be having for a long time <laughs> um, I intend to <laughs> yeah yeah exactly so so it's like with a view towards that um both I really want to discern continue to kind of like tease out and discern what your gifts are that you're bringing into this um and you know, as I was describing it to you earlier before we started recording, it's like, oh, I already sensed this thing about you and I want to get more specifics and more details about like, this is how Mary is doing these things. And uh, yeah, and, 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 you know, to whatever extent it's, it's useful, like compare notes about that. And, mm -hmm. um, but then also, um, yeah, with a view towards like collab, maybe collaborating on this vision and like, what would that look like? And what could it look like? And what kinds of uh, things would we need to put in place? Or what kinds of challenges we, might we run into? And uh, kind of like 
brainstorm about that and see what it might look like and um on a on a level of like co-creation so um yeah i don't know i just kind of want to like with that in mind kind of want to just like really open it up and see where we want to take it of like hmm, what what could be useful to talk about at this particular moment given that this could be a, a long and exciting joyful <laughs> beneficial ride mm. Mm. I feel like possibilities mm -hmm. um so many possibilities and and one of the things that feels um one of the trade-offs of of doing this work is it feels like i've kind of had to do it alone mm -hmm. like one of the mm -hmm. one of the things of not having collaborators and being on a on a team i'm also the type of person that just like i have so much energy to be doing things but the I'm a yes person if someone's like let's do this I'm like yes absolutely and like meet the person in it and there's like beautiful and magical things happen uh from there but it can sometimes be hard to have that energy in in myself or kind of to continue continue doing that mm. um or like there has been ways that I thought myself like not as an ideas mm. person mm. which I don't think is 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 very true but um I think there's so much um yeah, it's like what's what's the vision and you've you've um we've talked about or kind of we've shared some of the the, the long-term vision um views or you shared that that with me and, and so kind of being like well what are the how to get there it's like okay mm -hmm. we're level seven you're level seven you want to be a level 50 like what are the the in incremental things what's mm. the what's the pipeline that that exists there um what has what has already happen such that like what's already what either of us have has done such that we can build on top of that um i think it's the article that you sent on the art of collaboration mm -hmm. uh, which was absolutely beautiful and and one of the things that st stuck out to me or one of the one of the phrases that comes to mind right now is like a do it larger or like like Im like make it larger do something more of it mm -hmm. so it's, it's like what feeling into what both of us have done and where is the next area of of like growth or even the next thing to do and to prototype and to to see how it works i i uh i feel like i want to do like a small thing and then mm -hmm. like see where that goes and mm -hmm. and do a larger thing and kind of continue continue that um that that growing i felt very intrigued by your like projects um mm -hmm. thread on on twitter and then how you've you talked about it in the conversation with uh, was it alexa alex uh, I, alex yeah alexandra. Alex, alexandra about uh yeah even how your process was of relating uh with that which is what you've which is like how you think about it how i understand you talking about empowerment is like with the thread of who is this person and what is of service that they can create in the world and how to bridge that mm -hmm. um i feel very intrigued by that it's like well mm -hmm. what how can we work together to see these these like the, the the people that we know and what is of need in service and create these connections and depth and and we have other people do that i don't know mm -hmm. I, I, there's like different possibilities and brainstorming that's that's happening in my mind mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah i'd be curious to ask like I, i'm well and i'm also partially aware that like over the last week i was like scurrying and sending you lots of things which you kindly read and so there's a lot of like shared context in this conversation that might not be obvious to the someone listening and so just for the sake of them like yeah maybe to start i'd be curious to hear like what what you sensed into or heard or read or like digested over the last week as like kind of that long-term vision like what that would look like um because i that's that's still like forming in my own mind like I, it's like it's almost like a, an object like came into view of like, oh, I could do this thing and like, I should do that thing and it will be good. And <laughs> I'm curious to hear how you would describe the ob object from your perspective. There's an image that comes to 
mind for me and i don't i don't entirely know how it fits in but some way of like people being these these like light bulbs or being these kind of like light objects and you coming into contact with those people and like making it brighter like having like either adding fuel or whatever it is that you bring to the world such that they shine brighter and then and then like illuminate the space around them and if like the the world is a is is like a darker gray place that's kind of uh, going through it there's like if if they're the people are like light it up and you are someone that that brings into kind of comes in and see what is it the kind of fuel that they need that's particular for that person such that to light up uh the world and what are the connections between what does the world need in that in that moment mm -hmm. in the it's interesting that you've been using the word empowerment because one of the i think it was a blog post an outline of a blog post the title of that was encouragement mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and for me the two of them feel like interchangeable but mm. there is nuance between them mm. um and i and i and i come back to like the cores of the words so like empowerment of of like a center around and be like power and creating um capacity and and courage when i think about it it's like courage it's just like the the energy to move to move forward um, I recently saw a little post on like different types of courage of like mm. of, of um, physical courage, social courage, which is like become, being um, authentically who you are, like intellectual courage, emotional courage of of feeling everything that you're feeling. And so then connecting of like encouraging people to to be full versions of themselves and empowerment to to then like propel them forward mm -hmm. into something in a way that they have not been been able to to do that mm -hmm. i think you have a gift of seeing like you see you see, <laughs> see with eyes unclouded i know it's from somewhere but it's it's it, i don't know where it's coming from but like i feel like you have a capacity to take someone and because of the stance that you have towards them um that like they're you're able to see what is what is possible what is it that they want what they what they like the best version of them in some way and then to be able to support that wholeheartedly mm -hmm. um i think that's a gift i think that's a that's a huge gift to to have and and then like you're also not afraid to share it mm -hmm, mm -hmm, again mm -hmm. eric seeing like you're everyone's number one fan is like <laughs> that's a superpower in itself to have uh -huh. the the um, um groundedness to be able to share with people what you, what amazing things you see about them it actually takes um like it it, it, it takes immense courage in ourselves mm -hmm. and in you to be like I think you're amazing. And people mm -hmm. be like, no, I don't think, I don't think I'm amazing. Be like, no, I still believe that to be, to be wholeheartedly <laughs> true and stay in that truth of what you're seeing mm -hmm. um, that to be. Yeah, I think this, this, we talked a bit, a little bit more fine detail last week, but this sort of image of a pipeline begins with that, with seeing who someone is and what their gifts are even before you do anything with that information, just seeing it. And then um, I think it moves into more of this, what you're talking about of like encouragement of just like reflecting that back to someone and, uh, you know, sharing it with them, helping them to see it and to act on it. And then it sort of ends in sort of this empowerment thing of like, okay, now that we're on the same page about who you are, like, what can we do with this information and mm -hmm. how can we set you up for success? Does it mean getting you funding? Does it mean connecting you with someone? Does it mean like getting you tutoring of some kind or coaching mm -hmm. or like, mm -hmm. you know, does it mean something else? Um, and that's part of why this is so exciting to me is like, yeah, I'm thinking about this in the context of your coaching as well as like, 
I mean, yeah, just to back it up, like I, the vows I took, one way you can see that is like, I vowed to save all beings. It's like, how do you actually do that? Like there's so many <laughs> beings, there are numberless beings. Like, how do you actually do that? And I think that's become like kind of a guiding, almost strategic question for me is like, how do mm -hmm. I help? It, it, like I've transposed that into something of like, okay, like let's just hold on the saving everyone thing. <laughs> <laughs> and like, what can I do to be of service that is both benefiting many people and benefiting them deeply, right? Mm -hmm. And so when I look at something like your coaching or even my initial attempts to do something in this direction, it's very clear to me, um, I don't know, basically that, that it doesn't scale in a certain way, right? Like you can only help so many people Mm -hmm. through coaching and I can you know I one of the things we talked about was this like project assignments that I did it's like I could only give those to so many people I couldn't do the exact same thing again in the same structure and it's like there's a possibility of doing this at a higher level such that maybe it, it I don't I don't know for sure what it'll look like we'll have to see but um like maybe the exact number of people doesn't quite have to scale but the impact the ultimate impact of how many people are mm -hmm. benefited and how deeply they're benefited. Like you can be more or less um, skilled in how, like the choices you make and who you work with such that like a, a bigger impact that's deeper is had. And, and um, yeah, I don't know. Does that, does that resonate with you at all? It, it does resonate. And I think there's another perspective that I have of, mm. um, something along the lines of of like would you or i be satisfied if we saved all beings but we didn't know we saved them mm -hmm. like it would you be okay with having saved all beings having made the impact but you didn't know that's that's what happened <laughs> mm. i'm not sure there's I'd be curious to hear more about that question, like what you're seeing that makes you ask is such an interesting question. And like, I imagine maybe that there's like a value that you're standing for. And something that comes up for me is like, I feel I, more and more, I feel like this is just like the central thing I'm harping on in like every project that I work on and everything that I say, everything that I write, everything I do is just like, like, I just want to like beat this drum as loudly as I can, which is like, <laughs> at least for me, and I, I'm pretty sure for other people, but at least for me, like, I don't know, I've said this so many times and yet I've never said it satisfactorily, but it's like, yeah, I don't know, this is it's gonna, like one's deepest service is not separate from one's deepest joy. Mm, and mm -hmm. so like mm -hmm. in that situation that you're asking about, like if I didn't know about it, how would I enjoy it? Like, how would I enjoy that I'd saved all beings and like be connected to them? And like, mm -hmm. you know, like, I, like I'm just imagining like, uh, like a universal dance party because we all just, <laughs> we just saved everybody. We finally did it. You know, I mean, I don't know that the whole like theology of this is real interesting or the eschatology or whatever, but in any case, um, like for me, it'd be like, well, if I don't know it, I can't enjoy it. And it wouldn't be this mm. like, like for me, service being a benefit mm -hmm. is delightful. So like in a way that does require you to know about the impact you're having, I think um, like that's not the important part, but like it should both be of benefit to others and be like the, the other people's benefit is not separate from your own joy. So like there's just something missing there. Yeah. Yeah, I absolutely, I absolutely agree with that. And, and not that we should be in service of something and then just like not actually see the impact of it. Right. But what you were speaking about is, is like, I, um, there's something there for me in recognizing that the, the, the things that something that I've been, I've been, I've been learning because of, of like how relationships are interconnected and how people are related to one another. It's like something that I, do might have ripple effects so far from me that I will never find out mm -hmm, about mm -hmm, it. Mm -hmm. And so there's a way of like, how can I focus on, on working with an amount of people, but putting attention on like how to increase the ripple effects along mm -hmm. those people and do in such a way that they then create ripple effects that then create ripple effects. Mm 
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, just like mm-hmm. I can't save all beings, but I can I can encourage or like do everything that I can so that other people want to save all beings such that the things that they do save other beings. And if there is enough of that, mm-hmm. then there is then then that's the only way that I can I can actually make a difference. Absolutely. 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 Yeah, I completely agree with that. I mean, that that's one of the biggest reasons that I've doubled down on loving kindness meditation is like if even just one person is you know, coming from a happier place where they're more loving to themselves and others and kinder to themselves and others like that, that's like the conditions to have those like tremendous ripple effects. And of course, though, I try it. So this is sort of like why I would say it's like a strategic perspective is just like, Mm -hmm. because that's been one of my interests is strategy is like, um, it's not it's not binary, basically, like, yes, that is true, that if you impact one person in that way, that has tremendous widespread benefit, many of which of is invisible. And um, at the same time, yeah, I don't know, maybe like maybe a different way to put this is, you know, I was talking earlier about your coaching or my project assignments. Like I am acutely aware. It's like, yes, this is good. Like the coaching you're doing is great. And if someone is listening to this and they feel called to work with you, I would whole, like not even having worked with you, but just from this conversation and having talked to you, I'm like, you should go do that. Like if you feel called to work with Mary, go do that. And similarly with the project assignments, like that was great. And Mm -hmm. it's like, these things are very good, very aligned. What we're doing is like very similar. And there's undoubtedly a version of it that like helps more people more deeply. And I want to like find that thing Mm -hmm. and like, like go in that direction because it's, it's not binary. It's not like, oh, we just have to help one person at a time. We can scale it up, you know, in a way that doesn't sacrifice the quality, you know? Yeah. Or that, that when we scale it up, we can no longer do that, do the thing that supports that that yes. person is there's actually there's like a transcend and include as things as things uh as things change and for me it's like coaching feels like something that is closer to it but it's not something that i'm married to mm-hmm. uh but it's just like oh <laughs> it's it's just like that's an expression of what is wants to be communicated and what wants to be expressed that way but it actually can can grow and i feel so uh like i yeah i want to find I want to continue finding that thing because it'll always scale to be something, something uh, larger. And like, that's the beauty of it. Like mm. once we run out of the things, then like, what do you, what do you expand for? Mm. Mm-hmm. What do you, what do you strive for in a way to, 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 um, to grow? Mm. Are there any ways that you anticipate yourself needing to grow, to go, to move in this direction? Uh, yes, I think there is a um, like a leaning into an abundance mm. mindset away from mm. a scarcity, um, a scarcity around time, mm. around um, money as well, um, around. Um, I think it's it's the whole thing I was talking about, like relationships and and selfish work. It's like how can I how can I step into the value that it's created that it here that isn't. Um, like feels integrated. I think mm-hmm. I think there's a lot more of like things come to us only when we're ready mm-hmm. for them. Yeah, I said this to you last week when you said something similar, but like that I um and I've said this elsewhere as well, but just that like for me I've replaced the word selfish in my yeah. vocabulary <laughs> with self-oriented because it's like, yes, this is for me, but it's not it doesn't have a moral negative connotation. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I think now that I think about that, I think that's actually part of the reason I'm so bullish on that is like, if you're giving your deepest service to the world, like that is a self-oriented thing to do, Mm -hmm. you know, Mm -hmm. like it will not, again, it won't like you will be enjoying it. So like, that's good for (laughs) you. And like, you should have that joy. That is a very wholesome and commendable joy that you should get lots of, you know? Uh, And so it's like, yeah, that's good for the world. So uh, anyway, I'm, I'm wanting to like, yeah, maybe um, do this thing keep we saying, were talking about keep earlier. It, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's like Mary, you're doing great. It's okay if you enjoy your work and really like it, and you know, like you're helping people. It's good. Like that's there's a reason you're enjoying it. So, uh, yeah, yeah. I I know I've been really sitting with some of the ways that I expect that I will need to grow, and like that's part of why it's exciting to be connected to you because I think one of them will be, for example, being a better judge of character, and mm. that's it's not like oh I'm a bad judge of character. Um, it's like there's lots of refinement to 
have mm -hmm. there and that's like an endless skill to work on and you certainly seem to like complement the skills that I have there and um, feel like we could both grow in that together and um, I think there's similarly of like yeah I, I've been thinking about it today as like there's a blind spot of if you consistently look for people's gifts you can be blind to what their weaknesses are or what their limitations are or their like vices even um, mm -hmm. like what their their problems are and there's a kind of naivete that comes from just seeing someone's gifts and being blind to their weaknesses or challenges. And so I think I'm going to have to find a way to skillfully integrate and honor what's good about seeing people's gifts without being like naive about any weaknesses or challenges that they might have, especially when there's a similar thing happening of like, they're not aware that they have that weakness or challenge in the same way mm -hmm. that they might not have been aware of the weakness or of the strength or the gifts that they have. Um, like there can be a similar blindness to one's own weaknesses that sets you up for challenges or difficulties interpersonally. And so I think, yeah, basically I'll have to be less naive. And then um, I think there's a whole host of practical skills that I'll have to gain to like actually level up in terms of, um, you know, uh, the, like kind of infrastructure is the word that comes to mind. Infrastructure mm -hmm. of like mm -hmm. rigorously, systematically at scale, providing these kinds of services to people. Yeah. 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 And how to do that skillfully and how, so how to create systems such that the systems work mm -hmm. for even mm -hmm. for others and, and how to then and fine tune them. It's something that I've also I've also been um, like being more in relationship with, and how to create uh, space, and how to create the structures and system that support, but also that create space and and breathing room so that they become, um, yeah, structure not constrictions hmm. on anything. What might that look like? Like giving these things space. Yeah, What's a, an example of that. Uh, so it's mm, let me an example uh, of it. It's just like creating. For example, it's like deciding what, like what podcasts or what kind of relationships I want to, I want to um, invest in or participate in. I have like a way that I created a structure of like the things that I look for and, and things that I orient uh, with, but not kind of sticking strictly to that, uh, but giving it also space to, to be curious, to lean to curiosity and over time being like, okay, I've tried this out for, for a month, this particular structure, is it working the way that I want it to be working for me? Is there anything that can be changed about mm -hmm. introducing like periods of, of reflection and not just getting stuck in the structure and seeing that the way that the structure works for, for me, rather than, than it's a, it's a constriction. It can often happen with goals as well. We set goals for ourselves and then like life happens and you're like, but I need to stick to these goals being mm -hmm. like, okay, like you created them as to support you to get where you want to be. Where are you right now? How do you relate? What's like, what's your relationship to the whys behind the goals that are still caring for them and how to change in a way that feels in alignment um, with you? Mm. Coming back to this, um, you know, we were kind of talking at different scales and you're like, we sort of discussed what this longer term vision might mm -hmm. look like. And uh, you were talking earlier of like, oh, it'd be nice to work on like a small project next. And I think we should talk about that uh, like after this in the coming days and like maybe hash out something that would be fun to do there. Um, and I'm wondering, yeah, but I think that's like basically better to have off the record, uh, not, not that it's like super secret, but it's just like uh, like what what makes sense there. Um, but I'm curious if there's anything else like in that territory of this direction that feels exciting for you to talk about or to converse more about. I think what feels valuable for me is like in the midst of collaboration, um, keep this is a tweet that really resonated with me of yours of like mm. the relationship is the most important thing mm. and like through that project see that as a medium of of seeing one another and what are the things that we are caring about and how we are learning mm. it's so valuable to hear what are your growth edges mm. what what are the things that you anticipate coming up against so that um we can then kind of put pause whatever the project is because it's only it's only medium it's mm. a medium of growth of of doing the thing that we're both the, both both caring about and how to pause and be like okay this is the this is a, a growth edge this is a learning edge uh for me how to support that and how we can we support one another um because i've had experiences of collaboration that like i finished the project i was like 
I don't want to ever do that again. Like <laughs> I felt awful about it because I totally. wasn't able to bring myself into it and wasn't, wasn't kind of at the forefront, um, at the forefront of, of like, what is the relationship and who am I in this, in this collaboration? What can be brought forward? So it feels so meaningful to even this song, in this conversation, but put, put attention on who are we, what is there to learn and what are, what it's like, what are your own weaknesses mm. that you're seeing? So it's like, how can you see that in yourself first and be non naive in yourself? What are your gifts and your weaknesses such that we can then, um, see them, like see them all as, as gifts that are brought in, even your weaknesses. Mm -hmm. And and mm -hmm. mine as well, being like, yeah, I might come up with like, I can't eat today for this long because I have so many other things. It's like, yeah, that's the scarcity <laughs> thing. Like, <laughs> let's work with that. Let's call that out. Let's 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 hold this as a as like a learning ground. Mm -hmm. Totally, totally. Yeah, I love that. I mean, that's part of the joy for me is like the growth, the growth that comes with these situations and. Um, yeah, like seeing myself grow, seeing someone else grow, like growing together through these kinds of processes. So um, I'm also like, there's a way in which I'm aware that, um, like I found it useful to put, um, yeah, like I was talking earlier in terms of levels or like um, difficulty levels on things where it's like, oh, this is the challenge level right now. And like the most challenging thing that I will ever do is like become a Buddha and save all beings. It's like, that's on the agenda. We got to yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you know, but maybe... anything less than that is not as hard. It's not, not, not hard. the hardest exactly. thing you'll ever do. Exactly. Like that's one of the sort of like practical benefits of having taken the Bodhisattva vows. It's like, <laughs> nothing is going to be as hard as that. So uh, here we go. You know? um, but... You're, you're going to have to, you're going to have to throw some of that over to me on the fence, being like, there's nothing as hard as that. Uh -huh. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Well, that's the nice thing about um, seeing everyone as a Bodhisattva is just like, um, I don't know. Uh, there's a way, um, how to put it. Yeah, there's ways ways that people are connected to that sort of thing, even if they don't use that frame, but um, where that lesson is might or other things might be available to them, even if they don't use that frame. But um, that's sort of in the weeds. But anyway, so Bodhisattva vows become a Buddha. That's the hardest challenge level. And like within my own life, because unfortunately, I don't expect to complete saving all beings or becoming a Buddha in this lifetime. Although, you know, don't let me stop myself either. <laughs> but um, uh Assuming perhaps poorly, perhaps very reasonably that I won't become a Buddha and save all beings in this lifetime. Um, like, it seems to me that this particular direction or project or ambition is um, like probably the most challenging thing that I'll do if I actually go in this direction. Like I had, I had previously thought that um, starting a meta dance club would be the hardest thing. And uh like, or at least on the radar, but this is definitely gonna be harder. And also I've like had revisions with how I think about that project of like, oh, I don't necessarily need to have a club. I, but um, anyway, that, that being aside, like I see this as being like probably the hardest like practical project I'll embark of on in this lifetime that I'm currently aware of. And so um, there's a way in which like, yeah, I'm just excited. I'm, I'm saying that because I'm excited to see like all of the growing that will be required to like actually meet these ambitions because it will undoubtedly require myself and possibly you to like grow many levels. And that's oh, exciting. Yeah. 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 Um, well, is there anything else that you'd like to say or talk about before we head out? I think this has been so full. I'm like, I don't even know if I'll be listening, like I'll be able to listen back to it. I might have to like listen back to it in some, in chunks. Yes. It's been, it's been a, a pleasure mm. to, to chat with you. And I think I've spoken to things that I might have not spoken beforehand. So it's mm. wonderful. I love to hear that. And it's really been a joy and a delight for me as well. So I look forward to uh, talking with you more in the future and protect about these projects and directions in particular. <laughs> mm. Exciting. What a teaser. I love, yes. I love a good teaser. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for your time, Mary. You're very welcome. Mm.